So um, I'd like to introduce Daniel. And um, the reason he's here is because uh, I asked him to, uh, if he would like to do a presentation on curl and the state of things. But the real reason I like Daniel is because he has a really nice sense of humor, which is a reason enough to follow him on, on Twitter. And uh, who uh, doesn't like people who have a sense of humor? So I hope there's a lot of humor in the in the presentation. And if not, I'm sure there will be in the questions. <laughs> uh, and of course, I think he's going to talk about uh, um, something else than curl, but it's probably going to be about curl. So. Uh, go ahead. Quite a lot of curl, I think. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's a little window. <clears throat> Curl actually do run in all your devices. Uh, okay, so, um, well, first I wanted to take you on a little uh, uh, journey into my inbox because that's a kind of an interesting adventure, actually. This is uh, actually uh, an email I got several years ago from a lady who actually, she claimed her uh, Instagram account was hacked. Um, and. Uh, she wanted my help and I, of course, had no idea what she was talking about because what do I have to do with Instagram and why are you asking me about help with that? Uh, uh, but then she emailed me back here and told that, yeah, well, she she was in contact. So she wanted to then prove what she was talking about and showed me that, yeah, my name is there in Instagram. So surely I, I know everything about Instagram so I could help her and just talk to my friends at Instagram with her problem. And I then tried to convince her that, no, I, I actually had no idea. I never saw, saw my name in, in Instagram before this. So, oh, that's cool. And I tried to convince her that, well, I only wrote a piece of code that they're using. I didn't even know that, but you know, a piece of code, they'd use it. And, but okay, and I, I think I managed to convince her eventually. And then uh, she wrote me back <laughs> after a week and said that, well, since you weren't aware of that, uh, but uh, obviously you have been lying the entire time because I also found your name in Spotify. And then obviously because my name was both in Instagram and in Spotify in her phone, that was suspicious enough so that she threatened to tell me uh, and sort of snitch on me to the big companies that we really don't, I really don't want them to know that I'm actually a part of Instagram and Spotify hacking ring because obviously what would otherwise be the explanation that my name is in two separate applications in her phone. Anyway, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this Spotify and Instagram hacking ring that I started working on. I actually released curl the first time under the name curl in 1998 in, in March and then it was a rename of the tool I already had been working with since late 1996. So it depends on how you count, but anyway, it, it became curl in 1998, a small little thing I started then and it took off. But nowadays I work on for Wolf SSL and I do curl support and curl contracting, whatever curl uh, full time um, every day. So curl then is not only a Spotify and, and um, Instagram hacking ring, it's also an open source project and we create and produce one uh, command line tool and a library and for transferring data using internet protocols, which is a pretty, you know, big scope actually, but that's what it does, you know, specified as a URL transfer your uh, data up or down. And here are some command line examples. You just type curl and the URL, of course, uh, we would in most cases do something else too than just the URL. But, and of course it, it's a library too, so you can put it in your application and do internet transfers there and it's very easy. And this is one of the most basic cases. It looks like this when you write it in source code. <clears throat> but of course, all of this started once upon a time when there was nothing and, and uh, there, of course, are always building blocks of, around and we all build on the shoulders of some giants from before. And in the year of the great movie Independence Day, in, it's actually 1996. No, that's 98, I think. Then um, 
sorry, I'm going back and forth. That was 1996 because I was working on an IRC bot back in, in 1996. And when I, when I did that IRC bot, we were chatting people from many countries in the same channel. And sometimes uh, we were discussing things and the prices of things. And I figured it would be interesting to provide a currency exchange service so that you can actually ask a little bot, how much is 100 USD converted to whatever currency? Uh, we had more currencies in Europe back then, so it was more, you know, uh, all the different currencies or a hundred US dollars to Swedish crowns or whatever. And in, 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 to be able to do that currency translation, I needed to download currency rates every now and then, maybe once a day. And to download currency rates once per day, I needed a tool that could download them and the currency rates were provided on HTTP servers. Well, one particular HTTP server that I found that I wanted to. To download from so i wanted to do that and i found a little tool called http get that i started working with and things went on and uh, i started to change it put all the code online renamed it to curl in 1998 and by that time i had found currency rates on gopher sites <laughs> and on ftp sites so it supported three protocols and that it could also do uh, ftp uploads actually by by 1998 because I had some early users who wanted to upload as well. So why, why shouldn't I implement that? So there was a little tool that started then in 1996. It was only, I think, a few hundred lines of code. I think a little under 300 lines. And by 1998, in the March there, it was 2,400 lines of code. And it became curl. I put it online. And wow, what a massive uh, success, right? Because already in... Um, by the time I released uh, version 4.8.4, which then was in December 1998, so from March to December, more than 300 times. It was downloaded more than 300 times, which I, of course, was really thrilled over. And it was sort of, yay, people like it. And I, <laughs> looking back at this little news item, I think it's, uh, it's cool that I was so um, thrilled over that. Uh, attention which by today's measurement is not um, so much so it started the back then if you look down in the left lower left corner 2400 lines there in in march 1998 and then we added code we had fixed bugs we added features we had the support for more protocols we had the support for more tls backends blah 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 and all and the, the linear growth of the number of lines of code is fascinatingly linear, I think. So by now, mid-2021, we're at 170-ish thousand lines of code. Um, this is lines of code in the actual products, uh, curl and libcurl combined. Um, and contributors. We immediately, already when I released the first version of Curve, we had a lot of, well, we had contributors. That means I didn't do it alone, no, not even back then in 1998. So I, I released it online and got people to submit bug, uh, bug reports and people started to you know, provide bug fixes as well. And it went on and on. And over the years, I'm, one of the things I've tried to make really careful, uh, make sure that uh, I keep track of is, giving credit and thanks to people who help out and uh, everyone who ever helped out in curl have their name in the thanks file and this is the number of names in the thanks file over the years so the growth is uh, kind of spectacular so it's right now it's 2420 something names we're adding names at the rate of about 200 per year i think new names so i'm certainly not alone in, in doing this. There's a lot of people helping out. It's a big community. And uh, another fun fact, then just to, to add to the, you know, the growth of the, the number of lines of code, the number of contributors that we're adding a lot of things. We also add a lot of command line options then to control all the new features and all the new capabilities of curl. And as you can see, we started out with, I think we started with 24 command line options and I don't remember exactly, 28 maybe. And, and now we're up uh, in the 242, I think, options. Um, and as you can see, we're adding them at a quite a decent rate. So I think it's about 10 per year over the last few years. So there's going to be more command line options going forward as well. So now then, from 1998, 2021, 
now curl can speak a lot of protocols it has a lot of features and is feature packed with things to do internet transfers in yeah in a lot of different ways and varieties of flavors and, and, and ways whatever you think you want to do it so it's really become the swiss army knife of internet transfers and http ones in particular so much that you know the the curl the phrase the verb curl can just mean just curl it could actually be understood by people and i that is also what i think is some measurement of success is that when you coin a verb you're you're there but what is hard i think is to explain what curl is to to ordinary people sometimes i try to call it as a bridge between the cloud and your devices or your application and something else there that's the bridge in there it helps you do the transfers of data up and down between something and something <clears throat> and it really is widely used we, uh, we joked about it a little bit earlier but someone's not using curl every day but if you're using any kind of internet server today it's internet servers everywhere is pretty much always loaded with curl curl is provided as a default http transfer engine in php for example php powers what uh, i think a large percentage of all web servers around the web today and all the big uh, services are using curl in different ways a lot of game consoles kitchen utensils smartwatches placed um, sort of game consoles and all these uh, streaming platforms and devices they use it it's very popular in games so if you use one of those uh, popular grand theft order 5 or fortnite or uh, these things very popular million some of them billion players they all use curl other devices media devices uh, apple tv this very big in cars i counted it present in 22 of the top 25 car brands it is present and used by um, it's present in uh, mac os and in all apple devices and it is used by some of the apple softwares that comes bundled and it's I think it's in roughly half a million TVs by now. It is suddenly, it's by default shipped in Windows 10. It is by default shipped in iOS on all tablets and on all, uh, I mean, it's a Google Android and most of the other Androids as well. So most phones and tablets have it installed. And then not only in the OS layer, but also in a lot of the popular uh apps so if using instagram face well not facebook maybe but uh, google photos or instagram or spotify or a few of those uh, um, skype too so it's used everywhere and in most tablets and uh, mobile phone <laughs> mobile phones is actually installed many times so all in all we estimate i estimate the curl and libcurl then exist in around 10 billion installations worldwide maybe a little less maybe a little more it's really hard but somewhere in that vicinity curl then is a product of uh, it is curl the command line tool that is powered by libcurl and this is just a schematic of what things are right so this curl the tool it uses libcurl libcurl then does it, it does transfers of data and it can use data then from tcp udp and the file system basically like this this is a very rough schematic one one of the reasons then that curl and libcurl is widely used and, and popular everywhere is that um, you can also customize it perfectly for your particular need if you build your own curl or libcurl which is what most of the device manufacturers for example do or if you want to build it into your application you might choose to do that sort of switch off a lot of things you don't need enable what you want and you go with that customized solution so that you get rid of what you don't need and you get focus on the stuff you want so and also of course that it powers supports 26 different transfer protocols uh, well uh, transfer protocols in the level uh, in the url transfer schemes basically uh, so a lot of that, it's, uh, and a lot of users are actually using more than just one or two or three protocols as well. Libcurl then provides also, um, it's, it's a standard API to do, it's not a standard, but it has become more of a de facto API to do internet transfers 
And a lot of people have then written bindings for different languages on top of libcurl to allow anyone using any of these languages to write internet transfer uh, applications that are powered by libcurl. So virtually whatever language or environment you're in, you can use a native binding to, to do internet transfers and still be powered by libcurl to get all the powers and, and uh, speed and features of libcurl into whatever language you want. But libcurl is, of course, a, an API and a library that provides internet transfers, but it itself also uses a lot of different third-party dependencies. And in this map here, we can see all those different green boxes are different third-party libraries that curl can be built to use. So uh, these are actually 36 different ones. But a, a typical build won't use all 36, but a typical build will use a subset of these depending on platform and features and what you want uh, your libcurl to do. But uh, thanks to all those third-party libraries also, it, it uh, can do all those funny things and get all these powers. <clears throat> libcurl and, and curl has been ported to at least 86 different operating systems, which is frankly more operating systems than I any mortal ever probably can um, mention. But it's a fascinating number and a, and a fascinating num, uh, list of operating systems. And of course, it also runs on virtually every modern CPU architecture, if it's 32-bit or larger at least. And uh, uh, that's rarely a problem. You, it, as long as you have a compiler and it's 32-bit, uh, you can run curl there. And since not so long ago, it has been confirmed that it actually runs on two planets as well, since it's been confirmed to be used in the Mars helicopter mission on Mars, which is fun, which makes for this fun slide at least. Um, and all of this, of course, it is one single API on all of these platforms, on all of these planets, on all of these CPU architectures. And that is, I think, one of the powers with curl is that it is a unified API on everywhere, on all of these platforms that makes it possible for your, for anyone, anyone's applications or use cases to just move along wherever you are you can always use that api to do the transfer and of course if you can uh, see curbing um, showing up on different places which is i think that's uh more of a sign of having succeeded is when you know the nasdaq building in new york can have a curl command line on on the big display there this is actually many years ago i think it's actually they were introduced this company was introduced on the nasdaq i think so you could actually run the command line to order t-shirt, which was I thought was hilarious. <clears throat> but it's a genuine photo of the actual Nasdaq building. And here's a, another genuine photo of a, a billboard outside the Silicon Valley, also a number of years ago. And in this case, of course, a curl command line that is completely nonsensical and uh, uh, nobody who knows anything about curl understands what at all this is about. And I, but the, the funny side story is that I blogged about this and sort of joked about this. And the, the guy who was uh, responsible for the marketing of that <laughs> emailed me and said that he was, uh, he apologized. <laughs> I was embarrassed. <clears throat> okay, but anyway, so I, I we ship curl and, and they, it is used everywhere. And according to the license, you should also include the license and show that you're using curl in your products. So, and the, the curl license happens to have my email address in it. And that makes it end up in funny places. So people email me about their problems when they find my email in their devices. Like for example, if you have problems with your GPS in your car, you find my email address, you email me to get to know the answer, which is kind of hilarious actually. Uh, I, I get uh, a number of these. And in most cases, it's just fun actually, because it sort of, gives me an insight into where people have found my name and therefore uh, that product is using curl so it's a sort of a discovery mechanism for me and um yeah and curl is also as sort of frequent or common use of that for example in this case there was a security problem in cisco small business routers uh, well this is over two years ago now but what do you do when you when you end up with a uh, security problem in your router. Well, 
you might, for example, and this is kind of hilarious because someone found this config and they, to avoid the, the security problem to get exploited, uh, this firmware had an update to just update their uh, web server config to ignore or rather um, filter out command line command requests with curl in the user agent thing just a fun little anecdote but of course it being used everywhere and it being that swiss army knife for internet transfer it also means that it's a it's a pretty convenient tool even for for the bad guys for malwares and others and for example we have this little example that in well this is in, from several years back now in 2015 i noticed that the, the the curl website started to get a lot of traffic because suddenly a lot of users were downloading the the windows package and suddenly it was downloaded 300,000 times during a single month which at that point in time at least was uh, exceedingly much and, and surprisingly sort of stood out from previous months and I didn't really understand it it then accounted for over 70 percent of the used bandwidth of sites so and then after a little research I realized that yeah it was a malware that sort of infected computers and it downloaded curl from the curl official website and used curl to spread itself over to to more computers so yeah I actually then renamed the the curl windows package to another name to make sure that the malware itself would start fail failing those downloads so it sort of i would at least not help the, the, the malware but uh of course the the updated malware then made sure that they bundled curl at instead in the next version of uh, of the malware so <clears throat> my little rename didn't actually do much but it just shows that even the malware authors of course they need uh, a good transfer library and it is used then in a lot of other uh, maybe not fun but uh, big uh, known celebrity malware things that uh, are present everywhere and all of these things are using curl themselves so curl of course ends up in a lot of bad places and and th things that i of course don't approve of i wouldn't I would rather they don't use curl and they'd rather they don't show me in association with this kind of stuff but it's you know if you make a hammer someone is going to use that hammer for some bad things as well it's nothing we can prevent and uh, we can't do anything about it we just have to live with it do they include the license they rarely do but some of them actually well some of them have some um, you know they they market their malware uh, software sometimes you know this is an attack tool for blah 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 and in those cases they sometimes um, market themselves as using curl so it's, sometimes it's not hidden sometimes it's just something you have to figure out um, and i think that in in many cases when i've found out it's more like the victims have realized that they were targeted by curl for some reasons because there are some ways sometimes to detect that it is curl. For example, curl, the command line tool, uses the user agent curl by default. So you can see that it's curl uh, that makes a request. So if someone then is a victim for one of these tools, they might see curl in the user agent. <clears throat> so what all of these users, uh, they of course use libcurl because libcurl, then I'm talking about library here because the library is what every one of these are using because curl the command line tool just just a little subset of users the, the majority of all the users are using libcurl and people like libcurl and they use it because it's it's very stable we have had the same api since forever basically since we introduced it from around 2000 2001 so if you build examples from then they still work it's you can then use that same api everywhere and since we have the same api for so long it's been very well documented and you know it's when you can polish and refine something for so long it actually becomes pretty accurate and well you know elaborate and, and detailed and so on so it becomes really good over time it also makes it if you google for help today you you know you can find an old document from a long time ago but in our case it's actually still accurate because we haven't modified it for a very long time and of course it's open source it's free and mortal and, and uh, it'll survive whoever dies or, or don't die or, or remain 
and it's been it's been there we've been around we're proving ourselves we've been we've been proven our product for a long time so if you want to go with a product that's been around you know it's proven we have 10 years or 20 years of proven um, success there's not a lot of choices to go with and of course you can customize it as i said you can switch on and off a lot of features um, go with whatever you want and you can go with whatever back uh, third party dependencies you want like we support a lot of different tls libraries and so on 14 to be specific <clears throat> and we're being uh, sort of we're keeping up to to date we're we're on the bleeding edge for most of the updated versions of all the protocols too so we support tls 1.3 when it ships we su supported http 2 before it shipped we support uh, http 3 at the time it ships we have already the support in the code so if you want to be there and want to run the latest stuff we have it as well and then whenever i talk about curl and say the number 10 billion installations worldwide uh, ordinary humans then ask me so why would i give it away why is it open source i wouldn't have been in been a billionaire if i hadn't done it open source but of course that's not the truth and i wouldn't have because it would never had it wouldn't have existed like this it would have died in 1998 already if i hadn't done it open source so open source was never not I mean, not doing it like this was never an option for me. I wanted to do it already when I did the first version because I wanted to be as cool as other open source authors. And I wanted to have this help and ability to go everywhere and, and test it everywhere and get feedback and, and sort of get that cool loop of contributions and bug fixes and iterations over time to, to reach where we are now, which I, of course, didn't ever expect or anticipate, but it wouldn't have come here unless it had been open source so no i wouldn't have been rich otherwise either because it would have not been a curl today so how do we do this <clears throat> how do you do curl first you get all these 143 relevant rfcs which is roughly 280,000 lines of documentation and these are the primary ones that document protocols <laughs> that curl supports which i would probably i would guess and venture that very few have actually read all of these because and if you add up all the words in all these rfcs the that's a lot of words so <laughs> it actually becomes then more more words than the entire harry potter series or the entire lord of the rings series in this little schematic war and peace nothing in comparison um but again i don't think anyone has actually read all the words in all those rfcs i i might have but um uh, well, you can usually get around by just browsing them or, or digging as, into our president, as our president would say, I have no active memory of that. <laughs> right. But usually you can just, you know, when you know, when you need to know in a specific detail, you'll go back there and you read up on it again or refresh or, and, and, and that's the benefit of, uh, of being a lot of people, right? So there's going to be a few that are experts on whatever particular area you ever you want to venture into. <clears throat> so basically, this is how we do curl. We have curl, and it's done by, I mentioned it before, 2,400 contributors, and that's that's in the wide, sort of most liberal way of, of looking at the contributor because you're a contributor even if you reported a bug. That's enough to be counted as a contributor. But you can also have, you know, helped out with the design. You have suggested ways to phrase documentation. You may have run an infrastructure. Maybe you wrote a test script. Maybe you contributed code whatever everything that is a contribution and out of that 900 it says 910 i think it's 900 and, well a little bit more right now but about 900 people that have written code that has been merged into the code repository and out of those about 150 authors write code that gets merged into curl every year and uh, roughly 12 of those authors are regulars that are actually doing like more than 10 commits per year and out of that that's me that's i'm the only one who has done more than 10 commits for every year for 23 years or 25 depending on how can <clears throat> but that's how it is so we, there's a really really long tail of people contributing and out of the authors most of the authors of course ever just contributed once and never returned again and then there's a bunch of more that contributed twice and so on and so on so there's of course a, a very, very there's a small subset of people that ever contributed a lot and a lot of people that contributed a few times but that's good 
every contribution counts. So it doesn't matter if a, a single time contributor is also a contributor. So we get contribution. We do releases every eight weeks on the clock. So we know that every release is uh, 56 days, unless we do it shorter. We do that sometimes when we mess up and have to do a panic release. So we do a, we get contributions from, we actually get, yeah, uh, contributions from 40 and uh, maybe 60 per release, somewhere in that uh, range. And we're getting more and more people actually over time. Um, but again, as I mentioned, we're a very small core team. Curly is still a small project. Um, there's just, we're maybe, uh, well, yeah, as I said, 10, a dozen people who are actually still hang around year in and year out. So, and we're all volunteers. There's only one person who, who works on Curl full time, and that's me. All the others are doing it more of um, volunteering and uh, occasional uh, work permission to, to do something. Everything we do is in public. So whatever you want to discuss, ask, design, we do everything uh, in public, in Git, on mailing lists, because mailing lists, because we were in, you know, old traditional uh, open source style. We started in the 90s, so we have most of the discussions and everything, like how to design things, architect, rework, we do it on the mailing list. Of course, we have moved over to GitHub in, in modern days. So nowadays we work pretty much like um, like other GitHub-ish products. So we have, you know, put, you submit pull requests, we have issues and stuff like that. And we have, I think we, we are around 20 people who have push rights that can merge other people's commits. But I think maybe in practice, we're five or 10 people who are actually doing it regularly. I still think I merge most, maybe 90% of all commits I merge. I personally make around 55% of all the commits. I, I mean, I author them. So who pays for all this? We're all spare time hackers, or most of them, most of us are. So uh, there are some companies that pay contributors for features every, every now and then. I, as I mentioned, I sell curl support and I do curl contracting. So I actually do my best in trying to make sure that companies are actually paying and hiring me and us to fix bugs fix their feature, make sure that we do more things uh, and maybe develop features also because companies want to have more things and new things. <clears throat> we also have a lot of sponsors and this is a set of them. We have a few sponsors that are paying for uh, servers, bandwidth, time, infrastructure, and then we have a bunch of more infrequent uh, we call them the donors or basically that's chipping in money monthly to make sure that they fill up our um, um, fund so that we can primarily use that fund to pay the bug bounty that I will mention in a second. <clears throat> but of course, we make software, we release it every eight weeks, but of course it crashes eventually, right? So how do we make sure that whatever we ship is secure enough for 10 billion installations worldwide. <clears throat> we start out, of course, as any open source project should or want to do is that we review code. So we review whatever's change anyone uh, proposes. We have a more and more strict code style, which makes it easier to review and it makes easier it makes the code easier because the code should read as it as if it was written by a single person, right? The style is consistent and the same everywhere. And we have documentation that documents not only how, how all the APIs, the external APIs works, but also the, we document internal stuff, things, uh, pretty much everything in the project should be documented so that everything can be understood without even actually having to ask anyone. And if we have to ask anyone, we correct the docs and update it accordingly. We have a lot of tests. We have many tests. We add more tests all the time because that's the only way we can make sure that things remain functional, right? When we change things over time. And with CI like crazy, we have right now, I think, I think it's around maybe a little bit over 100 CI jobs per commit and per pull request, which they take a long time to run, but it's really good because they they catch a lot of mistakes. So once we have all the CI tests run green, we can be fairly sure that this is at least not a bad commit. Um, 
so it's good. And of course, we run with a lot of sanitizers and checkers like Valgrind and, and, and different address and memory and, and you know, undefined behavior sanitizers. <clears throat> and we have, uh, we run with a whole bunch of different static code analyzers to make sure that we, that the code makes sense and doesn't uh, have any obvious flaws. I mean, they can still have flaws, but we check with all the tools that are available to catch as much as possible before the code lands. And we also run fuzzing both on code before it lands and uh, in particular on code after it lands, because fuzzing is really uh, the after once you have everything green and fine by the sanitizers and the code analyzers and that might be all green and fine but then you throw on fuzzing and fuzzing will take us to the next level <clears throat> and we also try to have code audits every now and then and a few years ago we had a paid code audit by a commercial company who actually specializes in code additions and they read through and found a few issues actually a whole bunch of them and we fixed them so we're doing our best to make sure that we, we live up to our sort of the expectations and, and what we want here. And we also make sure that we promise and offers pure money for whoever reports security problems that are actually security problems. So our curl bug bounty is a program that if you report a bug and we, f we confirm it, we hand out pure money. And the, the last release, the most recent release was curl 7.77.0 and in that we paid out a new record amount for a single bug that we paid 2000 us dollars for i mean to the researcher who reported it which i think is great and uh, we've in total we paid over i think 9000 usd by now which i mean if you count and look at the big guys the big companies it's of course nothing but if you compare to other open source uh, smaller open source comp uh, projects that we are actually uh, then it's I think it's really good so I'm uh, very happy I'm very happy uh, about that and we're going to continue to pay more money to more security researchers to make sure that we get more security problems fixed okay so yeah I am the lead developer and I have started this I still do a majority of all changes in curl and this is sort of how I do it so but I started out of course I did this for myself that's how it started I had a niche I started to scratch it and that's what I've been working on it since and uh, what I think is important for me and for for a leader of a project or an open source is to make sure that I allow and enable others to help out and just keep at it and and um, you know, knowing in which direction you're going next and, and making sure that you make the right decisions for should we do this or that? Sh should we accept this? Should we reject this? Uh, is this the right decision? Is this the wrong decision? Uh, it's really, really hard. So it's really a matter of just making making up decisions along we go, as long as we go and uh, sort of trying things out and not be scared of maybe rip things out if it's wrong and maybe feel feel our way through it. it it just has happened to work and if you just keep on going as we've been doing in this project eventually it might become something because whatever you do for 20 years uh, it ends up a lot of time and a lot of i mean you have a potential and possibility to do something if you just keep keep doing it for a very long time so i have this as a this is my primary hobby to do curl, even if it's my job nowadays too. So I have it both as my job and my primary hobby. So I spend roughly two hours spare time per day on curl, which I've then been doing pretty much since I started and probably a, a little while before that as well, before it was curl. And uh, I started getting permission by my employer in 2014 to actually spend a part of my work days on curl when I worked for Mozilla. Um, so then I started to actually spend more than my spare time on it and I'm doing full-time curl since 2019 so it's uh, I think it's approaching two and a half years now so I'm spending a lot of time doing curl um, so yes and a totally mix and blur spare time and work because I don't have to separate them I have the luxury and fortunate position that I can just do curl whenever I want uh, how much I want or how little I want and as you can see at my contribution chart there from, from GitHub, 
taken just a few days ago. Uh, I do quite a lot of commits all days every day. There are some white spots in there. <clears throat> so doing things 23 years, you know, it adds up. So whatever I've committed code to curl in 4,500 separate days. I've spent roughly, well, and this is an estimate again, about 17,000 spare time hours. I've done 16,000 commits and I've sent 25,000 emails about curl on the curl mailing list. So again, whatever you do for 23 years, you know, the numbers grow. And then I'm maintaining a project like curl is a lot, lot more than just writing code. Writing code is the easy part, right? Everyone can think about the writing code part, but then we have other things like, oh, right, security issues. And that can be really hairy and take a significant amount of time to figure that out. Oh, I have to do release management, you know, get release free feature freezes, handle everything, re release logs and change uh, release notes. And oh, right. And someone has to take care of the website. Who's that going to be? Yeah, that's me. And I run the site. So I have to admin the site as well. And the mailing list, of course, I have to do that. So I have to set up the software. I admin the site. I uh, admin that, that. Oh, and I feel a pretty strong responsibility to, to review patches and comment on them so that I as I mentioned before, make sure that everyone can contribute so that it helps me being, if others can contribute easier, it, it will help me in the long run, the more, because then they can help the others and so on. And of course, I want to support everyone who has problems to make sure that they can use curl more and then they can help other users. And then I occasionally blog about what we're doing with curl to make sure that everyone is on board and, and understands what we're doing and can comment and, and, you know, feedback and, you know, criticize and whatever. And there's a lot of, since I do so much about the curl, uh, so much of the curl development, I think I do most of the hairy stuff, the, the architecturally, you know, changing things and, and digging really into stuff. That means that some of the most hairy debugging stuff I get to do, which can be really time consuming. And of course I do a lot of the merging uh, pull requests and stuff. So, and eventually every once in a while, uh, there's some new features far too little code uh, is new features these days and of course we have to remember to write documentation update documentation fix documentation and every once in a while we do events uh, we have a, a annual curl developers conference for example and the very important task is to also to get stickers and send out stickers um, i did a mistake the other day to ask on twitter about uh, who wants stickers and i got a bus load of requests. So I've been spending far too much in the last uh, few weeks uh, arranging stickers to get sent out across the world to a lot of countries. And of course, I do talks like this. And that takes a little time too. But uh, I mean, everything this is time consuming, energy consuming, but also very fun, right? Because otherwise I wouldn't do it. So I'm enjoying everything on this. Just wanted to mention that it's a little bit more than code. And of course, I do all this because I think it's fun. It's fun. It's really appreciated. I enjoy it. So I'm keep trying to make curl as good as possible. And I get that positive feedback loop and people are enjoying it. They say thanks and they're, they, they're happy and I need a hobby and now it's my work. So why not? And if you do, and if in my case, I happen to also get a medal from this guy at the right here on the image is the Swedish King who gave me here, it's not actually his medal, but he handed over this medal, the Poland prize to me in 2017, which I got as a, it's an engineering award in Sweden for engineering sort of accomplishments. Pretty fun. Anyway, so now then what we're doing, what are we doing now in curl? So yes, on curl, it never stops, right? There's always more. We've been doing this for 23 years. A lot of people ask me, uh, or, you know, they, they, they say things like, well, I used curl 10 years ago and it looked exactly the same as it does today. But so what are you doing all days, every day? I mean, how can you work full time on something that is, I can see a difference, but there's always things happening. The internet and the web and everything is changing. So as much as everything else changes, curl changes too, and we need to change things to keep up. So we are working on, or are hoping that we will soon get the ECH, the encrypted client hello, which is a way to encrypt more in the TLS handshake. The HTTP SRR is a new DNS entry to get more info about a site uh, um, 
before we connect to it and it, it'll help the ECH stuff and it will help a little, uh, maybe it'll help HP3 too. I'm going to work more on, on tiny curl with a separate effort for me to provide a curl build that is as small as possible, targeted for the uh, smallest possible devices, the devices that are smaller um, than they, I mean, they can't run Linux, they need something smaller. And of course, more HTTP3. It's incompletely implemented right now in curl. So there's more HTTP3 stuff to do. So in curl, there's a future because st stuff that they never get completed, right? Protocols changes, open source will survive. And there's no slowdown in curl. We're actually having a higher development pace with more developers and more contributors than ever before in curl's history. And I'd like to show this little sort of graph because this is the, the more the official roadmap for curl there will be more stuff in curl over time and so we will we will go there um, we just don't know exactly what it'll be and exactly when but you know that's that kind of spirit and of course it's open source you can help uh, submit bug reports file pull requests um, whatever we appreciate it and all of this is written in the book everything curl which also another open source project it's uh, elaborate and very detailed documentation about pretty much everything I said today and a lot more about curl, how to use curl, what it is, what it's not, maybe, and, and stuff like that. And the URL on this uh, slide is wrong and not updated, but uh, it works still. It'll take you to the new URL. Thank you for listening, for me yapping on, and I'm talking fast now because I feel that I've taken a long time. So questions or anything else? You're actually very accurate compared to some other speakers we've had. <laughs> um, there are some questions in the chat. Perhaps it's easiest if you just look at them yourself. Yes. Or I, I can read them out. The oblig, oblig, let's do the obligatory. Uh, how does curl differentiate from wget first? So we have that over and done with. Uh, what's that? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no um, wget. First, first I uh, wanted to say that, of course, I didn't know about wget when I started curl. If I had known about wget, but at that time, I might have taken another route and, and then history might have diverged. But, um, but I would say that wget is um, the, the primary differences between wget and curl is well i would say but wget is primarily a tool to download stuff with and it's really good at downloading stuff and in particular downloading recursively because downloading recursively uh, is something curl cannot do so if you want to do that that's wget um pretty much everything else is better or more polished in curl i would say but then I'm not at all biased. Uh, but uh, but wget is a fine project, and I've actually contributed code to wget as well. Okay, let's see other questions in chronological order. Um, I'm skipping just the the comments. I'm only doing the questions. Uh, yes, uh, there's never a need or desire. To do some API cleanup or overhaul? Uh, of course, there's always both a need and desire to do that. But um, there's also there always also the, the sort of the I mean the the cost benefit um, balance there. Should what what do you need to what do you want to rip out and what do you want to introduce instead and what's the price for for um, just to bring actually back in 2006 we actually removed a few options in curl and about uh, we bumped the so name the, the number of the so in, in linux so the shared library version and uh, that was an outcry from a lot of people then when we did that because a lot of people figured that was a painful transition to do and i mean that hurt very few users so i know and and i know that's a very that was a very long time ago, but now it's going to be a much, 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 much bigger thing to to rip something out of curl that has existed for so long. So we're actually making rather 
very, very big efforts to not change what we've once deployed. So sure, we can introduce new things, but changing existing things, that's going to be a really tough bargain to do. Even if, of course, some of the things we do, maybe we should have done them differently. <laughs> maybe not everything is, yeah, well, why well, we did we do it that way? It's such a, you know, in hindsight, maybe we should have thought about it a little bit better and done something in a more convenient way. And, it, and I think in particular among the command line options, some of them are really, you know, really weird and some of them are not as consistently done because some of the options we did 15 years ago and some two years ago and then not at all you know in the same spirit so maybe yeah but i think that's that's the price we pay for not changing what we once introduced okay um you're probably one of the younger speakers that we have um we have a a running joke in our uh, a programming committee that's uh, called uh, get them before they die so, so <laughs> some of the really old uh, um, uh, open source people you want to have them present one more time before it's too late uh, and that's a, a sort of introduction to uh, boss's question as he says do you have a potential successor for the major role you play in the project in any way uh, no, it's the easy answer. So no, but but so instead, I make sure that anyone could be a potential successor. In that, uh, I don't have it. There's no secrets. There's you know, I don't. There's no magic handshake. There's no particular strange password written on a magic post-it note somewhere. So everything I try, I make sure that everything is documented. Everything is made available. So this, there are no secrets. Anyone could continue it. So I'm sure that one one day when i stop either, either i die or just you know grow bored of it and, and go away someone else uh, will just you know shoulder the burden and continue from wherever we are at that point i don't think i don't think it'll be a problem okay um oh wow uh I think Jelle's question is not really a question. Um, Marcel Brouwers, geez, Marcel, can you read it out yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. I will. Uh, I will read it. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, Daniel, thank you for the presentation and uh, joining us. Um, I had a question about a PHP curl uh, that uses libcurl. I, I, I guess, right? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so um, I work at an organization uh, that uh, does not allow our servers to have uh, direct access to the internet, or at least most servers. Uh, but we can use a proxy, for example, to, to update applications, uh, etc. And I've noticed that sometimes with PHP applications, we have a, a little bit of a challenge um, that not every application seems to uh, support actually uh, pulling updates or uh, or other stuff over uh, uh, over a proxy, um, and I was wondering if you um, maybe have a tip or a suggestion uh, for this uh, for this issue. Maybe maybe the answer is obvious, but it's not entirely obvious to me. Um, so yeah, that's basically the question. No, it's not entirely. It is not obvious. I mean, a proxy is just a proxy. So, um, for for protocols like HTTP, using a proxy is is very straightforward and easy. So as long as um, as long as the application, as long as someone using curl and uses a proxy, it should just work and it shouldn't be anything. But if there, if there, I mean that question yeah. is open-ended it could be anything since i don't know the details of yeah so basically the the, the application doing the the curl request would have to actually set the proxy options and if the application doesn't support well the dev developer didn't build it in then it's then yes. it's a challenge i think pretty exactly pretty much so yeah yeah okay thanks Ah, I see that Yella rephrased this question, really. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, can you tell us something about the top three unexpected security lessons that can be potentially applied to other projects too? 
I think it's a it's a hard uh, question. Yeah, you know for the, exactly, and that's that's the first lesson, right? Security is really really hard. So whatever you think you've done right, it's not right anyway, because there's always going to be. No, I think I think one of the most I don't know. That's not a lesson. I think more of a, well, maybe it is a lesson for me at least. Is that uh, there? I mean, the the security community and uh, the people are so bloody creative when it comes to you know figuring out things and how to use them in malicious ways. So whenever I think, yeah, yeah, maybe that isn't co entirely correct. There's always you know uh, there's always a way to twist something bad into something horribly bad. So whenever there's a bug, there's always. And I think the Back in the day, if maybe 10, 15 years ago, when there was a bug in curl, that was just a bug, you know, it could maybe it crashed. Okay, that was a crash. We did, you know, something stupid. We fix it. But nowadays, when people find that crash, it's not just a crash. Nowadays, aha, a crash, that's an invitation to dig into exactly why and what it does. And, you know, you can always turn that crash into something uh, interesting. Uh, and what if you do this before and it can end up in a remote code execution if you just do this and that and, you know, a whole series of different events. So I think for me, it's, uh, security is a long, long lesson of whatever you think you, you could do with something. There's always someone that can, you know, take it an extra notch and two laps more and it could turn into something completely horrible. Well, that's basically true for with whatever little security problem we're working with. I, my first gut reaction is always almost sort of, well, sure, but what can you do with that? You know, you overwrite the byte somewhere. Yeah, okay, that's that's bad. But what's the worst you can do? And then repeatedly, I'd get proven that someone can come up with a way that you can actually use that to something really, really bad. But otherwise, I, I mean, and security. Then one, oh, sorry, what is it? And then on 10 billion devices. Yes, exactly. Yeah, then, <laughs> then, then, then add to that 10 times 10 billion. So of course, whatever you say, yeah, yeah, how likely is that ever going to happen? But if mm -hmm. that unlikely is one in a million, yeah, that's 10,000 times if you have 10 billions. So yes. Um, but uh, um, well, what's fortunate when it comes to security problems and those 10 billion installation is that the majority of those 10 billion installations, they're actually more limited to which servers they interact with. So out of those 10 billions, you know, they tend not to use random servers anywhere on the internet. So, so that's a fortunate position because that, that means that most security problems we have will not affect most users. They will only affect a small set of users, but still. Otherwise, I think just the lesson is just it's, it's it's just a never-ending uh, fight. Security problems they're they're always there, and uh, uh, they they continue to happen. And and uh, you just need to test more, fuzz more, and get more people to look at it, and they just appear. And what is interesting, I think, is that I mean we have a project here that is 23 years old, and this for for the next release that's still you know we're working. We have several security problems reported already um, and what's interesting with those reports and all the other reports we had over the years basically that they they find problems in code that is so old so it's not like you know they find problems in code we landed last month you know new things you know they oh new stuff find it no they find bugs in code that has existed for 15 years right so We've literally had a lot of people reading it, running it every, in t those 10 billion installations, some of the, most of them are running code that, you know, after 10 years, someone points out, wait a minute, look at that little thing. What if you, and then it turns into, so, oh, right. And then it turns out to be a security problem there. So, and, and that is, um, I think mean, that's just an ongoing story. <laughs> Do you have a, an example of a security problem you weren't able to fix because it's a feature? Uh, well, I, I actually think, well, then it isn't a security problem. <laughs> oh, but a lot of people don't think it's a security problem. Uh, no, right. So, okay, yeah. So that's a, that's a matter of definition, right? So mm -hmm. I actually... Uh, when people report security problems to us, and people do that as a pretty high frequency, so I actually get a lot of that. So I get a lot of, you know, 
I found this when you do this. So a, a lot of my time is actually spent on, wait a minute, you say that, I look at it. What, what does the documentation say? What's the, what's the reasonable expectation for an application or user to do that? How can you exploit this in a bad way? But if everything is documented, is it, then I, I really cannot define it as a security problem because then it's a feature by design and documentation. So no, I, in that case, I don't I'd claim it's not a security problem. Then it's more of a uh, feature. <laughs> so so uh, as, as sort of a bridge to the next question, uh, do you find yourself submitting uh, um, proposals to change RFCs because they're bad? in your opinion, or, don't, or do you not do it? Uh, well, I don't. Uh, so I guess when you read so many RFCs, there's a lot of stuff you see in the, maybe in the new proposals or in, in existing uh, ways that things are built or, or uh, set in the RFC that you would think, well, actually you could do this uh, better in this way. Yes, so it is exactly like that. But uh, it were, uh, I mean, for first, you don't really, you can't really propose a change to an RFC because RFCs are, they're already there, so you can't really, you can, you can change them, but they can mm -hmm. be made in up, you know, you can, you have revisions, updates, you can do yeah. updates. Yeah. So, but updates are then made by a working group in the IETF. So, to do an update to an RFC, you have to be, participate in that working group in IET, in IETF, which is fine, and you can do that, but it is also extremely time-consuming and, and difficult and, and hard work to do that. So, uh, you have to limit. Uh, you efforts into which of those working groups that's worth uh, spending time and effort into. Uh, so if it's just, you know, a tiny little detail in some little spec, it doesn't matter because then you can just uh, survive anyway. But I do participate in the, in the HTTP group quite a lot in the ITF. So I do provide my feedback and want to make sure that I bring my, uh, uh, not necessarily expertise, but my, my experience as a non-browser client into HTTP land, because in the HTTP group, they're often dominated by the big browser people. And but they're not the only... Money is. Yeah, that's the way the money is. And, you know, they're, they're, you know, they are heaps of developers, you know, there are many, and they're, you know, there's paid to do this only. So, yes. There are hundreds of them. So, and, and they have a very different mindset of whatever you do on the web. The, the browsers have their own you know, way of looking at it. So mm -hmm. I always sort of, I want to <laughs> sit there and remind them that, wait a minute, you can also look at it this way. And maybe that's not, uh, maybe HTTP is more, should be more like this and not that and so on. But of course, it's, it's, a, it's a balance and, and back and forth, of course, so because I'm not right because I have an opinion. But, so yes, mm -hmm. I, I participate quite a lot there to make sure that my experiences comes in there, and also that I can, you know, read others' experiences and read other comments about what they're doing. The HTTP group in ITF is a really good group because there's a lot of implementers present. So all the big uh, web server implementers are there, all the big HTTP client implementers are there. So whatever there's a discussion, you know, when you read the spec, should you inter interpret this little phrase should it be that way or that way so we can have a discussion there and end up oh it should be that way and maybe mm -hmm. i hadn't read it that way or maybe i disagree but if everyone else says we're going that way of course i will go that way too so that we can you know yeah. do the same thing uh, and, and everything will be better going forward so that's that this was actually the bridge to this next question uh by yella which i would translate uh if you have to had to say it very short do you have a plan? But the question is, how did you design an API that lasted so long without changing? Uh, pure luck. <laughs> so. well, you must have had some idea of how, how to start with this, even back in 19... Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the, the API, and the, the lib, I created libcurl in, in 2000. So I actually had the command line tool in two years before I made it into a library. So yeah, I had an idea. So I wanted to, uh, I wanted it to be able to survive a long time. And I wanted it, I actually thought of the IUCTL uh, function, 
when I, uh, I was sort of inspired by that. So I figured if I did it that way, it could survive a long time. And it did. And But I would say that it also comes to a, a costs, not only that, um, um, that I have to, you know, work to make sure that old behavior still works, but I also did some other trade-offs that make sure, for example, I've used function calls that are var args arguments, which means that, you, you know, you can pass whatever into them, which is a, has its very serious downside that you can't check types. The compiler allows anything, which makes it very error prone to write applications because you can't check input arguments uh, that they're the correct type. So some of the things maybe weren't that clever. It made it very good uh, in the way that it can survive a long time, but some of the things made it, I think, harder for developers, unnecessarily maybe. Isn't that the way the internet is? <laughs> well, so maybe. You cannot, you cannot depend on this string to mean the same thing today as it does tomorrow. Right. So perhaps it was a very smart choice. I yeah I think it. I mean, with in hindsight, I think it, it turned out to be really good, and I think it turned out to work much better than I had anticipated or expected. So yeah, I think it's. I mean, of course, you can look back and say a few of those things we should have done differently and should have reconsidered. And I particularly have often regretted that I added a bunch of functions that I then later figured, wait a minute, why did I add these? They, they don't really belong here. But that, then <laughs> that was too late. So now we have them there. Okay. So um, if you would, if someone would ask you to write a, an API design style guide, would you be able to do it? For curl, I mean, <laughs> or for lip curl. Uh, I yes, I think so. And Maybe. would it be painful to do it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. I uh, um, I have a pretty good idea how I would like to have had done it if I had done it, uh, sort of started over. It would be pretty much the same, it's very similar to what it is today. I would have expanded it somewhat to make sure that you could check types better or rather that the compiler could check it better but but otherwise I'm, i think it's pretty good as it is as it is okay um let's see if there are any other questions uh mark Janssen posts a url and then uh, a question mark uh, mark can you uh, expand on that oh that was not really a question oh okay so a reference to Again, something you said to, uh, or potential answer to uh, uh marshall's question ah okay good <laughs> not too sure about uh, that one i, I have i tried it on the command line didn't work yet <laughs> okay so uh uh let's see because this is what always happens so in the chat people are try trying to help each other Right. And then you're trying to relay that back to the presenter, but uh, it sort of starts to live its own life, which is good because that's exactly the way open source software works. Um, I don't see any more real questions in the in the chat. I think. Please uh, let me know if that's not the case. Um, I want to know uh, some more about the book you wrote. That's probably also a group effort. Yes, but uh, similarly, I wrote most of it. <laughs> so, so, but it's, so but it's there and it's open and it's um, it's written in Markdown, so everything is there and it, it generates the PDF and and the web version. So, so it's is entirely. The, is it open. a book you should read uh, uh, before uh, as as a closer of the day before you uh, go to bed, or is it more like a thriller you read uh, <laughs> during the daytime because it's so scary <laughs> that you won't be able to sleep anymore? You maybe you fall asleep good if you try to read it tonight <laughs> so, no no but but it's actually uh, i've tried to make it more um, more of a way to describe how things are tied together more maybe if you know reading learning things by reading the man page is not the way because it's just you know look up things how how do the different options work maybe you want to realize how to actually use the options in a, in a bigger uh, 
context. context. Yeah. So th so that's what I set out to do, and then I then it so that it basically covers everything. Curl. So it's <laughs> about the project. It's about the naming. It's about how to build it, how to run it, how to use curl the command line, and a lot of how to use lib curl the API as well. So this, it's uh, in a printed version. It's like 250, 300 pages, something. It's not nice. uh, something like this. Right. <laughs> it actually exists I'm, in a Chinese translated version that you can buy in print, actually. Seriously. <laughs> It's actually it's actually the first book by me in print, so that I turned out author for the first time in Chinese. That's kind of cool, actually. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so, so are you tempted to just uh, uh, curl parts of the book in the uh, online documentation, like snippets yep. from the book? You you can do that. <laughs> okay, good. Oh, let's see. There's another. Uh, this is just uh, uh, looking into T socks. Okay. Um, what's perhaps interesting is uh, uh, to dive a little bit deeper in the soon to be happening part. Because you said uh, HTTP 3 uh, is not really complete yet. Uh, no, uh, the implementation in Carl, right? So um, yes. no, and and the the HTTP 3 specification isn't released yet either. The, the quick uh -huh. one is. The, or rather, Quick is four different RFCs, so they're released. But there are two. Getting mosquitoes here. So there, there are two pending HTTP three RFCs coming. And so, how do you handle that? Because anticipating on uh, to be released specifications is a sort of a preemptive caching algorithm. Uh, right? Yeah. Well, but but um, in this case, I. I already would did. I worked like this with HTTP two before, so I sort of had a little bit of experience. So, um, pretty much, I know what's coming, and I've been working with it. That's the uh, the quick working group in IETF. I've been participating in that too. So, I, even though I haven't been that active, because that's crazy active working group, it's been quite impossible to follow. Um, so, um, so I know what's coming, and I, I know how the, the thinking goes, and I know. And I've been participating and talking to other guys who are, who are implementing um, quick and HTTP three libraries that do all the binary transferring stuff over the wire. Then, so libcurl is then using libraries to do the binary stuff over the wire. So but they are the ones who are actually doing the follow the RFCs exactly how the how, how to do quick and HTTP three over the wire. Mm -hmm. And then I'm more uh, doing stuff with integrating their libraries and make sure that I can glue that into the architecture of curl and how to do HTTP 3 together with the other HTTP versions. Um, but HTTP 3 and Quick, they were designed in a way so that they didn't define the protocol name and versions publicly. So you never used Q Quick v1 as a version until the RFC was File. So if you if you the previous versions and you know all the drafts they had draft versions. So if you implemented versions before the the final one, you used draft versions. So you couldn't you actually solved it pretty nicely. So and that's the same with HTTP three. So all the uh, interrupts and everything we've been working on for years now they're using pre-released versions when, when negotiating that. And um, then so, more specific. So does, more specific that, does, does that mean that you actually sort of try to anticipate on the choices that are being made by the work group? Uh, well, yes. Well, more like that all the decisions made by the work group are in different draft versions. So then you mm -hmm. interrupt with those draft versions and then you discuss in the group and you change things. And so the next draft version is not fully compatible with the previous one. So you change things so you have to adjust everything to work with the new draft version and then you do that iterate again and then oh and something else was bad and wrong and we fix that and we, we make a new draft version right so right. there's been 32 draft versions of, of quick uh, so it's been this process has been a lot of times and a, a number of those have have been designated interop draft versions and that people have made extra efforts to make sure that we implement these 
draft versions, and then we run all the different implementations, all the clients, all the service together in large matrix, and, make, and, and verifies that all the features work protocol-wise. Okay. And then you could, and then a new draft version, and, and then you know, nice. it goes. Uh, and then of course it's a challenge for everyone to implement libraries and clients and, and service to do all this. Yeah. And then from from my perspective, then when I write curl, I then uh, integrate one actually into it too because now it can build uh, to be three support with two different ones. Uh, mm -hmm. But I mark that as experimental, so you have to enable that uh, uh, yes. explicitly in your build. So I sort of I say I try to discourage people from shipping this in production because it's not done, it's not complete. So I reserve yeah. the right to change a little few things going forward. Interesting. So uh, here's the sort of hook to go to uh, the many TLS implementations or uh, uh, SSL libraries or how would you call them? Crypto uh, libraries. Yeah. I think there's an interesting thing to say there too. Uh, what I would well, like to know is uh, which implementation do you recommend? Uh, that's uh, sensitive. But, no, it's not. Pers uh, personal <laughs> preference, probably. Well, well, personal preference. I I personally use the OpenSSL one on a day-to-day uh -huh. -day business because OpenSSL, the OpenSSL one is probably the most complete one. It is the mo by far the most widely used one, uh, counting mm -hmm. users. So that's more of a, I would say that is the, the, the sort of the de facto one that people are using. Sort of the send mail of, uh, of mail servers. Yeah, pretty much like that. That's the, that's the sort of the, the vanilla the good analogy. Because so, send mail is also bug still bug ridden <laughs> like uh, OpenSSL is. Yeah, but then which library isn't? So uh, yes, but then of course, th then it depends on what your your use case and your preferences and whatever requirements you have. You go with other choices depending on, you know, different things. So what's the most interesting? Uh, most interesting maybe right now is the emphasis on Rust for everything. So Rustl's support might be one of the most that one of the, that's the most recent one we support the Russells. Russells, it's a Russell. challenge. Russell, yes. that's a challenge to pronounce. And there's actually there's a C API for it called Crustles. So it's, I don't know. That's <laughs> <being hard. laughs> it's to so, crush something. <laughs> yeah, that's the C Russells, I guess. Crustles, uh, I don't. Know. But yeah, so that's uh, that's the that's the most recent one. So I think that's that has gotten a lot of focus and, and a lot of work on that. So hopefully that should, you know, the idea then being that with the Rust instead of C implementation, it should be more memory safe and or safe in general. That's at least the, the idea. Let's we'll see about that. Yeah. First, you have to iron out all the bugs, bro. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And and uh, Rust as a li as a language and a language to do system libraries is highly immature for that. So there's actually a lot of, you know friction to smoothen out before it can actually you know uh, truly be an open ssl replacement for the masses i understand good well that's most of what i uh, wanted to know uh is there anyone else with questions nope nothing in the chat well that leaves then we can go to the informal part. Before uh, we do that, let us uh, let me officially thank you. Thank you very much for presenting in your free time in the outside, which is also a in the outside, cool yeah. feature. Yes. So I, I imagine you have a sauna there over, uh, over there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting in the sauna. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so now we have the informal part that uh, uh, allows us to uh, just talk freely and uh, uh, ask anything uh, to which, of course, you don't have to answer, but it's, uh, uh, I will step out as a sort of a conversation, conversationalist. Thank you very much. <laughs>